Annette, over to you. Thank you, Vanessa. And thank you all of you for attending this webinar uh, where we will talk about agriculture and climate change ahead of COP21. Um, and of course, we're to focus on the UNFCCC negotiations on agriculture. I would also like to thank our speakers for making themselves available to present for us today and for answering the questions that we may have. Um, I want to start by acknowledging uh, CCAF's Farming First and CTA for the creation of the toolkit and the timeline that we're using for this webinar. So let me begin by introducing our speakers. Uh, we will first hear from Peter Iverson, who is the Danish co-chair for the negotiations on agriculture under Substa about re recent progress in the negotiations. Then we will hear from James Kinyangi, who is the CCAF's regional program leader for East Africa, and he will talk about agriculture under Substa and uh, will go more into depth about the technical uh, submissions. Then Michael Howell, who's the coordinator for Farming First, will take you through uh, the UNF Triple C toolkit, um, learning you how to engage in the negotiations. Lastly, we will go through a Q&A session uh, where you can ask your questions to, um, to the speakers. Once we get to the question and answer part of the session, uh, we will use the, the chat that we have uh, for this webinar. So we would ask you to please type your questions into the chat box and ensure that the message is to all entire audience. Uh, we will then select the questions to be answered by the panel as we will anticipate that there would be some questions that are similar and also as we might not have time to answer all the questions. Um, so as I said, this webinar will take you through the history of agriculture in the UNFCCC negotiations and will give you an overview of the recent developments um, on agriculture and it will go more in depth, into depth with agriculture under substandard technical submissions. Um, that are made by parties and observers and then we will introduce you uh, to how you can engage in the discussions and the negotiations. Um, so we would also like this webinar to be a safe learning space for everyone so on behalf of the organizers I would request that all of your questions are respectful so please also remember that this is not a political discussion. So as you will hear from today's presenters, agriculture has largely been sidetracked in negotiations so far. Um, and we see the Paris COP21 in December as an important space for creating awareness about the importance of agriculture in the negotiations and in general when we're talking about climate change. So we hope that you'll be ready to engage and that this webinar can help you prepare for the COP. And we'll, with this, I will give the floor to our first speaker. Uh, who is uh, Peter, Peter Iverson. Over to you, Peter. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I hope you can see my screen now. I think I had a little difficult difficulties. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security Program for organizing this and for inviting me to speak here today on um, the UNFCCC and agriculture. So um, I have been participating in this process, UNFCCC, for I think more than 10 years now. And I have also been um, co-chairing agriculture uh, and uh, based on this experience, I, this is what I would like to, to share with you today. So agriculture plays a very prominent role in, uh, 
uh, plays a very prominent role in the uh, UNFCCC. So first I will talk a little bit about how the UNFCCC works and um, then I would uh, talk more specifically about the subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice where we discuss uh, agriculture right now and then also I would like to compare with the program we are having on uh, on Red Plus uh, under under Substa because uh, you could say Forest and and particular Red Plus has uh, made a bit advanced compared to agriculture in in terms of it has been discussed quite a lot for some years now. So agriculture plays a very prominent role in the UNF Triple C and uh, and if you look in particular at Article Two of the convention, which is the article that basically set out the overall objective of, of everything uh, under the convention. So the aim is to stabilize uh, greenhouse gas concentration uh, levels at the atmosphere at a level that will prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Um, so this is about, you could say, we want to reduce emissions somehow. And the second, this should happen also in a time frame uh, to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally to climate change because we cannot expect, I mean we are already seeing climate change and to ensure food production is not threatened and here you see I highlighted this in red really food production is uh, and, and therefore agriculture is in the center of, uh, of the overall objective of the convention itself so, so very very important actually the UNFCCC uh, normally have uh, sort of, we, we talk about uh, uh, adaptation, for example, uh, I mean we need to adapt to climate change and here we have quite a few programs. We have the National Adaptation Program of Action. So these are uh, programs that, uh, these are uh, targeted developing countries, they would formulate these programs and then they would get so, uh, funding for implementing the programs. Uh, then there's a Nairobi work program which is a, well, a work program that deals with adaptation not only agriculture, of course, and also the, the NAPA, as I mentioned before, is not only about agriculture, it can be about any sector in, in the country. It's really up to the country. And same for the Nairobi Work Program. It depends what parties decide that the Nairobi Work Program will, will deal with. But they have also in the past been talking about climate change. Then uh, at uh, COP16 in Cancun, there was the Cancun Adaptation Framework. Here we had national adaptation plans. Was uh, plans that developing countries should, uh, uh, well not only developing countries, actually all parties should develop uh, loss and damage. This At that time, COP16, this was only the beginning of the negotiations on this particular issue and uh, I think uh, first they finalized uh, in Warsaw with the Warsaw uh, mechanism on loss and damage and then the adaptation committee was also established. So quite a few uh, elements relevant for adaptation and, and all of it I would say relevant for, for agriculture. Mitigation, sometimes said this is sort of the other sign of the coin, uh, that on mitigation, first of all, of course, according to the uh, convention, all parties are obliged to, to try together to uh, avoid the, 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 to stabilize the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But in particular, since Copenhagen, all uh, developed countries also known under the UNFCCC, we talk about Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 sometimes, but all the developed countries were adapted uh, economy-wide emission reduction targets by 2020. So these targets um, uh, is economy-wide and therefore of course they will also cover agriculture emissions. Uh, some of these parties, not all, were also party to the Kyoto Protocol and they now are in the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol which runs from 2013 to 2020 and there we also have economy-wide emission reduction commitments um, and then finally for developing countries there was a they at the same time also agreed to uh, establish on a voluntary basis these national appropriate mitigation actions so these are actions that uh, proposed by the country itself and it does not have to be in agriculture but I think actually quite a few of them are in agriculture um, and these are typically plants that also has to be fulfilled by 2020 and some would be uh, they will mention this is uh, depending on uh, on support or this is something we will do regardless of the level of support etc so there can be different circumstances around this but all of these actually uh, to some degree 
will include agriculture. And just to, to give you a picture of, of uh, agricultural emissions, because these emissions are quite interesting from the point of view that, uh, well, they are quite significant. I think all together, maybe we we emit around uh, close to, is it close to 50 uh, billion tons of CO2 per year from all sectors. So you see here, it's around 10% from crop and livestock. Uh, I'm not, I mean, this sometimes it's difficult to compare data because whoever is uh, is compiling the data, they might uh, make different breakdowns. So sometimes it's, it can be a little difficult to compare. But these were the what I found from the uh, FAO website and gave it quite good overview of of uh, different sectors and how they would, would contribute to greenhouse gases. And the situation is that if we look at what is needed to reduce emissions. Uh, basically, fossil fuel emissions, I mean, emissions from burning coal, oil, natural gas, etc., has over time to go down to zero. I mean, it has to be reduced rapidly, but it has even to go down to zero. Agricultural emissions are, of course, we should also always try to reduce those as much as possible. But I think it's, at least for now, with the current technologies, it's very difficult to imagine them to go down to zero. So, over time, you will see as we get to 2020, 2030, 2040, you will see probably see agricultural emissions will contribute a larger and larger proportion of the total emissions. So there will be more and more focus on agricultural emissions over time. But of course, at the same time, uh, we need to produce food. We need to, yeah. So I mean, it's uh, it's quite difficult to reduce agricultural emissions, but some can be reduced, and sometimes we can produce more effectively, etc. Uh, finance is of course important both for adaptation and mitigation and here most recently the Green Climate Funds were established and I see that the board of the Green Climate Fund at its next meeting will discuss some um, uh, funding proposals and uh, I think I didn't look into all of them but some of them include agriculture I think there was something about early warning systems for Malawi and but there's other proposals as well so clearly, uh, Green Climate Fund will be an important source of financing also for agriculture. Standing Committee on Finance is more a committee to discuss the long-term finance. Uh, the Adaptation Fund, as name indicates, about uh, funding adaptation. Then we have the Global Environment Facility. This is not only a facility for the UNFCCC, but also for the Biodiversity Convention, etc. Uh, but but also it will be it's useful for agriculture. And then we have least developed country funds, and there's even more funds, but uh, uh, this least developed country funds, for example, is funding the implementation of NAVAS. So there's quite uh, a few different mechanisms that can help fund agriculture. If you, <coughs> so agriculture, you could say, is actually part of all these uh, activities or programs I mentioned. Uh, but to a certain degree, of course, it's up to countries how much they actually want to prioritize agriculture. So when countries make national adaptation plan, I think it's most likely that all countries will consider agriculture, but it's up to countries if they will like really put uh, the majority of the emphasis on agriculture or they want to focus on something else. For countries that have uh, uh, the economy-wide emission reduction targets, they can also, since it's economy-wide, they need to take the emissions from agriculture into account. They don't necessarily need to reduce them. I mean, if a country has said we will reduce emissions by 20%, they uh, could do this all from the energy sector if they think this is more feasible or this is more appropriate from, from their domestic economy. They could also do traffic or, they, or transport or, or they could also say actually agriculture also have to reduce emissions. This is, this is not something that the UNFCCC will uh, sort of uh, uh, instruct countries uh, to do. They will do, people will, uh, countries will have themselves to decide how to do this. And exactly the same for the national appropriate nationally appropriate mitigation actions. This is also up to countries what they have decided as nationally appropriate mitigation actions. And I think actually we see the same now in the process up to uh, COP21 where countries were submitting the uh, intendedly, intended nationally determined contribution. Also here, uh, I think quite a few countries, uh, well in particular the developed countries, I think all of them probably submitted uh, 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 
INDCs that were covering economy-wide emissions. But I think uh, other countries, in particular, maybe among least developed countries, they maybe did not cover all sectors because simply they don't necessarily have all the data yet. So then it's quite difficult to set a target. So you, you still need to, to uh, improve this before you can go to the economy-wide target. So, um, so why would we want to deal with agriculture separate from uh, other sectors? I think this is a question that uh, different people in the, in the process sometimes are, are wondering because they are saying why do we want to deal with agriculture separately? We don't have a separate work program for energy for example or for transport and these are also big sources of emissions. Uh, I mean for one I would say this uh, we, we have this tendency which is sometimes not that good I would say to split everything either into adaptation or mitigation. And adaptation we talk about in this room and mitigation in the other room. Um, but when talking about agriculture, this is, this is not always the uh, really appropriate because farmers have to adapt, of course. So you can say this is adapt ad adaptation. But if they, if they don't adapt, then this will also have a negative effect on emissions. Basically, you could say if your uh, yield per hectare are going down, then maybe you need more land to just maintain the same production. If this means also, uh, um, for example, uh, more deforestation, or it basically means uh, draining of a, a wetland or whatever, I mean, there can the if we are not able to adapt and we still want to produce food to everybody, basically we will uh, use more land and we are likely to use maybe also more input uh, to the production itself. So adaptation is really. Uh, necessary also in, uh, for mitigation and in terms I think you could even go as far as saying that adaptation is a kind of mitigation uh, but of course mitigation normally we, we look at it differently but I think for agriculture it's um, it's more difficult to split up so so that would be one argument why you would want to talk with on agriculture in, in, in the same room and, and both deal with it from adaptation and mitigation side, side at the same time and uh, yeah, I, 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 I mentioned this before, also the agricultural emissions are different, that they cannot, I mean we cannot imagine them really to go down to zero, even if we hopefully can uh, reduce them. Of course adaptation also have its limits. Uh, we see some uh, frightening scenarios, in particular if global temperature increases are, are going to go beyond two degrees, maybe actually already with two degrees, that some areas are will be affected in a manner that it's going to be very difficult, at least agriculture will have to change quite uh, significantly and possibly even areas have to go out of production and yeah, so, so it, it is, uh, it, 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 yeah, these are arguments I would say for, for, for discussing agriculture as a separate program. So now I will talk, I'll go into the uh, discuss a little bit about the subsidiary body of scientific and technological advice, uh, just uh, in short SUBSTA. So um, the SUBSTA works for both the COP, so the COP is the convention of, uh, of the, uh, well, the, the whole framework convention on climate change and the CMP is the, um, the meeting of the parties of the Kyoto Protocol. So both these bodies meet once a year and next time they will meet here at uh, COP21 in, in Paris. And, and the SAFSTA is basically in, uh, providing uh, information on scientific and technological matters to these two bodies. So normally what happens is that uh, a party maybe uh, would raise a particular topic to the COP and say, I mean, this is what happened with uh, the forestry, but we'll get to that, that they will raise a particular topic to the COP and the COP decides, okay, we will look further into this and if they think this has some, uh, it would be useful with some scientific and technological uh, discussions about this topic and then maybe then they will, the SAFSTA will be given this item, discuss it over a number of meetings and then report back to the COP with some recommendations perhaps and then the COP will decide what the next step should be. So uh, the SAFSTA can adopt conclusions, which means they can just—I mean—they can also themselves say, "We, uh, this is the way we want to work with this particular thing. We want now to, for example, organize some workshops. We want to invite for uh, submissions, etc." And then they can forward these draft decisions to the COP for their approval. 
So this is the way the Substack work, and the Substack body meets uh, twice a year, so not only one uh, time like the COP. Uh, so they meet normally at the same time as the COP, uh, but they also meet once a year, I think always in Bonn, normally in either May or June. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so there are two meetings every year. So agriculture under Substack. So there has been attempts to establish a work program for agriculture, actually from even before COP15 in Copenhagen 2009, there was a, a lot of discussion about whether to have a work program on agriculture or not, but there has been a lot of resistance to this idea. Uh, then finally, at COP17 in Durban, the COP was requested the SAFTA to consider issues related to agriculture at its next session, which was then the 36th session. So issues related to agriculture, and you can even when looking at the title, issues related to agriculture, it's not very specific. I mean, of course, agriculture, but it could be any issues. But this reflects a little bit the sensitivity about the issue. So it's not, it doesn't preclude anything, but it's not, uh, anything is, is still possible at, at this point, you could say. So the SAFTA had some discussions, and, and it took, as since the meet, uh, only twice a year. You can imagine it takes some time. And then at SAFTA 38, they invited for submissions from parties and observers on this topic. Uh, you can read here below. Use in the current state of scientific knowledge. Uh, let's see. Oh, what happened here? So I think, uh, yeah, so uh, the problem is I cannot see my full screen. So I, I think you can you can still see view on the current state of scientific knowledge on how to uh, enhance the adaptation of agriculture to climate change impact while promoting rural development and sustainable development, productivity of agricultural systems and food security in all countries, particularly in developing countries. And this should take into account the uh, difference of agricultural systems, uh, differences in scale, and as possible adaptation co-benefits. So, uh, following that, then there was organized an in-session workshop at SABSTA 39. So that was uh, together with uh, COP19, which took place in Warsaw. And uh, after each workshop, there will be a workshop report. I just put here because I, I know uh, this presentation has been given out as handout. This, handouts. This is the link to the web page devoted to agriculture on the UNFCCC web page. So here you can find not only uh, the report the, from the workshop in uh, at Substar 39, but also the submissions from the uh, later workshops and and from yeah from everything that has sort of been done over the last years on agriculture. Um, then at the following SAFTA, so now we are in June uh, last year, the SAFTA, after long discussions I could tell you, uh, decided to do further work. So they decided on, on four different uh, topics to explore this time, not only one. So the first one, uh, development of early warning system and contingency plans in relation to extreme weather events and the effect of, yeah, I cannot, uh, desertification, drought, flood, landslides, storm surge, soil erosion, and saline water intrusion. And then the second, assessment of risk and vulnerability of agricultural systems to different climate change scenarios at, at regional, national, and local levels, including but not limited to pest and diseases. So these two first topics, they decided to uh, invite for submissions and then also to organize workshops. The, the next two, so this is now we, we are still at these four different topics. So the next two topics, uh, I, I, identification of adaptation systems, uh, taking into account the diversity of agricultural system, indigenous knowledge system, and the differences in scale, and as possible uh, co-benefits and sharing experiences in uh, research and development and on the ground activities, including socioeconomic, environmental, and gender aspects. And number D, 
uh, identification and assessment of cultural agricultural uh, practice technologies to enhance productivity of in a sustainable manner, food security and resilience, considering the difference, um, yeah, I cannot read it on my screen, on these ecological zones and farming systems, such as different grassland and cropland practice, uh, practices and systems. So uh, these two uh, topics, they decided to, since four topics would be too much at one time, they decided the first two would deal with at uh, SAFSA 41, which were the one that took place uh, in uh, June this year, 15, and then uh, the other two will uh, will uh, be dealt with at uh, June next year, so in 2016. And uh, the Secretariat is then um, uh, requested to produce workshop reports uh, after the after the workshop have taken place. And, uh, and you can find at the website I showed you the link to before, you can find the two workshop report from the first two workshops that took place in June this year. So our, my personal impression from the workshop we had in Bonn was that they were very positive. There was uh, a rich exchange of uh, views and a lot of this actually you can also find on the website including statements given during the workshop and so on. There was a lot of sharing of country experiences including early warning systems, how yeah basically what countries have experienced in this and also uh, yeah just a very rich discussions, vulnerability and agricultural systems etc. I think very positive and it also became quite clear because um, normally at these workshops we try always to invite uh, countries from different continents and countries from different also climate uh, zones and both developed and developing countries to speak and it was very clear that all countries are affected by climate change in the agricultural sector and also that there are uh, space for collaboration. So uh, considering the difficulties in agreeing to have this kind of um, workshop I would say the, the outcome was actually very positive. Uh, and in the reports you can also, I mean, yeah, you should read the report. The, in the report, the, for example, there's a role of the convention in terms of adaptation, there's a role for SAPSTA, but there's also a role for bodies outside the UNFCCC. Uh, and both reports, I think the last uh, paragraph in both reports basically point to uh, uh, identify possible points for the way forward that has been mentioned during the, the workshop or the workshops. So I think in uh, the, the idea now is that at the SAPSTA in, uh, in Paris that uh, they, there's an opportunity to discuss the report, I think yeah, it's here, in Paris there's an opportunity to discuss the report but most likely there will be very limited time for not only for this item but for SAPSTA altogether actually because everything I would say in Paris are going to be uh, focused on on this uh, agreement that uh, basically the outcome of, of the work that is uh, called the uh, Durban platform work that was established actually since uh, the COP in Durban, COP17, that they decided to work towards this global agreement that would be agreed by at the latest by 2015 and this is the COP21 in Paris. So everything will be focused on that so I would imagine that the subsidiary bodies will have very limited time and since the, you could also say at this point in time, SAFSTA is not really uh, requested to um, uh, to come up with some big decisions. I mean, now we are in the middle of a process. We had two workshops, and now we have need to do the other two as well. So I think probably limited time will be devoted uh, for this topic in Paris. But then we will have the next one, of course, in Bonn next year. Uh, and uh, here we will have the next two in-session workshops. And following that, we, then we will have uh, two more uh, reports, of course, and then together when we have all four reports, I think that's when parties actually will, will decide what is the possible next step. Also because, not only because there's not much time in Paris, but also because um, you could say the four workshops was a kind of package that um, countries uh, agreed on, on all, a, all four topics to be discussed and and I don't think they are keen on, on sort of moving forward before all four has been discussed. 
So, uh, but I would imagine in Marrakesh, where COP, uh, I think COP 22 is supposed to take place, this is the place where they will discuss this. So, um, and and what could they discuss? Of course, they can discuss uh, based. I think they will look very much to what they discussed. They will look back at the reports. They will see, okay, what are the kind of things that we have discussed? What are the kind of uh, things that were suggested? Uh, and then based on that, they will they will discuss. And and very often they will also invite other bodies outside the UNFCCC to contribute uh, because we have a number of bodies that where you can have where agriculture is very central to their to their core mandate, and they will probably always be invited to participate or, or, or contribute. So, I promised also to say a few words about uh, forestry and why is it has been treated different from agriculture. So, there was a topic uh, called policy approaches and positive incentives on, on uh, relating to reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and, and the role of conservation, sustainable management of forest and the enhancement of forest carbon stocks in, in short, it's often uh, used the abbreviation RED+. Plus. This was originally proposed by Papua New Guinea and uh, Guinea and Costa Rica at COP11, it, that was in Montreal 2005. In fact at that time it was only called, it was only called policy approaches and positive incentives on uh, issues related to reducing emissions from deforestation. So the rest, forest degradation and the role of conservation and so on, that was only added later. So this topic has been discussed quite a bit over the years and quite a few decisions has been taken about this particular topic. And what the characteristic of this is that, first of all, this was only for developing countries. It's only about mitigation. It's about positive incentives and result-based actions. It's about national implementation, so different from what we had with, the, you could say, CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism already have modalities, uh, well, at least for afforestation and reforestation. And then it's voluntary, and uh, from the very beginning, this idea received broad support from all parties. And the work that SAFTA has been doing over the years has basically been to, um, I mean, the SAFTA was requested by the COP to work on this, and over the years, the SAFTA has then been developing all these elements to implement Red Plus. Uh, this is, uh, has been like national forest monitoring system, how to establish the forest emission reference level, uh, guidance for safeguard information systems, etc. Quite a few different topics, but very specific technical issues. And, uh, and I think this is um, something that SAFTA is quite good at. And, uh, and the, and the policy decision, because there was also policy decisions about Red Plus, that came directly under the COP. And at that time, uh, we had what was, we, we just used the uh, LCA agenda. So this was an agenda uh, or, uh, that came up to, uh, well, since Bali and up to Copenhagen. And, and under there, there was a specific item about uh, Red Plus, where in the end, we had the Cancun Agreement about Red Plus, which sort of established that political frame for, for, for Red Plus. But, but the SAFTA work itself was, was very technical and very specific to how to implement these decisions. For agriculture, I would say, it, uh, yeah, this is relevant for all parties, of course. It's both about mitigation and adaptation. And as we saw earlier, uh, adaptation is dealt with already in a number of places. Mitigation, well, can be dealt with uh, for developed countries. It's already included in the uh, in the economy-wide emission reduction targets, and for developing countries, it uh, can be included in the in the in the NAMAS. And I think the discussions that uh, I mean, one reason why it has been quite difficult to to discuss so far is that, especially when we look at the mitigation part of it, I think some parties are afraid that this could lead to some kind of commitment beyond what they agree elsewhere. And I think this is very relevant, of course, to what goes on uh, up to COP21 because a lot of the discussion here yeah, is this uh, global agreement that will be applicable to um, to all parties. Exactly how it will be applicable to all parties, of course, will have to be seen, but, but there, there are some uh, discussion uh, on this kind of thing and therefore there are some uh, sensitivities to discuss this also in a, in a separate form, different from the Durban platform. 
And then, of course, then there's also some parties that fear that this could have implications on uh, trade policies. So we don't discuss trade policies under the Climate Change uh, Framework Convention. But regardless, of course, uh, I'm not an expert in this, so I cannot say exactly what kind of compli uh, implications there could be or, or not be. But I just uh, recognize that this is a, a concern some parties have. Um, so, uh, and then of course, agriculture and food security is extremely important. I mean, I think most will also say forestry is important, but probably agriculture is even more important because, yeah, I, so agriculture has simply just been, uh, um, there has been more sensitivities around that topic compared to, to, uh, to forestry and, and Red Plus. So, the, some of the arguments that would be used to say that why should we have a program? I mentioned some of them already. I think there's no tradition in the UNFCCC process to treat one sector separate from all sectors. So, as I said, we don't have a, a special program for for um, energy, for example. Also, if you look at the SAFSTA agenda, actually agriculture is the only sector which has its own agenda item under SAFSTA. Red, of course, has been discussed there, and I think with the decisions on Red Plus that was agreed in Bonn, now have to be forwarded to COP21, I think actually this agenda item on Red Plus will be closed now after having been on this after agenda for, for a very long time, but I think all topics has more or less been exhausted uh, for Red Plus, and, and in particular since the Warsaw Framework on Red Plus what is, has agreed, then we have everything uh, ready for countries basically to, to implement Red Plus. The Durban platform, different from what we had at the LCA platform pre-COP15, does not have this kind of uh, long uh, agenda where, where these different uh, uh, sub, it's, the Durban platform basically only have two um, agenda points. They have the global agreement that will be applicable from 2020 and then they have the uh, the the agenda about uh, pre, I mean, enhancing the level of ambition pre 2020. Uh, they don't have this kind of um, uh, sub sub agenda items that where you could say here agriculture could have been. But anyway, it would be too late to put uh, agriculture in the agenda like that right now. Now it will have to go into the to the text itself if if it should go anywhere. Uh, but of course. It could be done. I mean, if looking at uh, Red Plus, this was proposed by two countries, and immediately it got a lot of uh, support. Uh, the same, of course, could happen with agriculture. Uh, but I also know from experience that uh, there will also be some. That in the past, at least, it probably have to be very precise exactly what the what is uh, what we are trying to achieve because I don't think wise I think there will be this concern that this is overlapping with existing work and what and so on and, and redundant and yeah so um, but yeah if uh, yeah I think that's basically all I can all I can say I mean it's not to say that it's not going to happen but uh, but for sure it needs to be proposed by countries and then it needs to get broad support so with those words I think basically uh, I'm done with my presentation and I hope I'm fitting with the time more or less and maybe I can hand the word the word back to maybe Annette, I'm not sure. Thank you Peter for that very informative presentation. I hope that you all found this as useful as I did. Um, so just for clarification, if you have questions for, for Peter, please type them type them into the chat box. Um, and we will get back to them after James and Michael's presentations. So I would now like to hand the floor over to James Kinyangi, who will speak more about agriculture on the Substa. The floor is yours, James, as soon as you're unmuted. Uh, thank you, Annette. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, and thank you very much, Peter, for providing that extensive background on how agriculture is being treated in the climate change negotiations. Um, I, I, I think 
one thing we could do is to really appreciate the background that Peter has provided uh, and to understand that uh, that uh, the um, the negotiations on agriculture has really provided the platform for increased understanding uh, of the difficulties that uh, smallholder farmers, fishers and pastoralists and the majority of uh, the rural poor who are engaged in agricultural value chains. Uh, and so the agriculture negotiation truck in the UNFCC provides us uh, with an opportunity to really ventilate in terms of the countries and to understand the risks associated with climate change and climate variability and to start to anticipate uh, what sorts of programs we could undertake under cooperative agreements within the UNFCC talks and beyond and to bring those collective efforts of uh, the countries, the parties and also those who are involved in agriculture as a livelihood and as a business uh, in order to secure those gains and a changing climate. So I think Peter provides my, my um, contribution here really with the background uh, of, of, of starting to understand uh, what is it that we are focusing on. I think I will not dwell very much on the SABSTA process uh, as he has uh, really explained what the SABSTA process is. Uh, but just to begin to say that uh, it is interesting what we are seeing coming out in terms of the views that are being exchanged by the parties. Um, as Peter mentioned that uh, uh, SABSTA commissioned um, two, two areas of submissions, one on the development of early warning systems and contingency plans and this was specifically in relation to extreme weather events and the effects such as with desertification drought, flooding, landslides, storm surge, uh, soil erosion, saline water intrusion, ETC. And the second area was the assessment of risk and vulnerability of agricultural system, systems really in terms of trying to understand impacts uh, through different climate change scenarios both at the regional, national, local levels and including but not limited to pests and diseases. Next slide please. And uh, in, in, in the next slide I, I was going to Hi everyone, be patient with us for a minute. We seem to have disconnected with James. We will work on reconnecting him in just a moment. James, can you try speaking again, please? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me again, Vanessa? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, as I was uh, indicating, I think I was requesting the next slide uh, to say that uh, the two areas for which Substa will be requesting submissions in 2016. Next slide. Uh, will be the area on 
adaptation measures in order to respond to the uh, vulnerability of agricultural systems, to climate change, and the areas of... Uh... Next slide, please, Vanessa. And the area of uh, technologies and and practices related to adaptation of climate change to Vanessa, are you able to move to the next slide? That would be slide number three. Thank you. So this this slide actually indicates the two other areas that um, SABSTA will be commissioning and accepting submissions in 2016 that are related to the identification of adaptation measures, uh, taking into account the diversity of agricultural system, and also in general the assessment of agricultural practices and technologies to enhance productivity, as I mentioned earlier on, focusing really on sustainability, uh, food security, and also building the resilience of agricultural systems, uh, understanding that agricultural systems are part and parcel, integral components of, uh, of, um, of uh, managed ecosystems. Um, and this really, the, the entire focus in SABSTA providing uh, for these uh, areas of assessments is really to respond to Article 2 which uh, states under the Convention itself that uh, everything we do uh, will respond actually to the need to ensure that food production is not threatened. Next slide. Now, in, in, in general, let me say, and, and as, as Peter had, he had indicated earlier on, that uh, we are expecting that this process under SABSTA will actually lead to two reports, one report uh, that will be considered at uh, the upcoming SABSTA 43 in Paris in December, and uh, the other reports that will be considered at the subsequent SABSTA, SABSTA 42 in Bonn in June next year. And we anticipate, as Peter had indicated earlier on, that at the conclusion of these discussions under SABSTA, that we will have a, some sort of conclusion or some sort of decision that will be forwarded to COP. Uh, and, and so therefore we subsequently expect that uh, as we move on to Marrakesh, that uh, the issue of agriculture that was opened up when we, um, uh, uh, under, the, uh, under the separation from the long-term cooperative actions with the Durban decision, will then be coming to a close under the Substar track uh, as we move towards Marrakesh. Next slide. Now, uh, in listening to the presentations of the parties, uh, it's uh, becoming very clear that there are certain areas of convergence, there are certain areas in which parties are expressing differences, uh, and, and this, to a large extent, represent how complex and uh, the nature of agriculture is, uh, whereas we all agree that uh, we need to secure agriculture and the, under a new climate regime, uh, there are still differences between the parties as to how they see that happening, uh, and I think the process under SABSTA in terms of enumerating the scientific and technical elements is very important. We see that, that there's, there's an active discussion amongst the parties uh, which are bringing out regional differences, they're bringing out differences at the country level, they're bringing out differences at the local level, uh, they're also bringing out differences in terms of how we understand the, uh, the, the global context of how agriculture needs to be treated. So I, I think that uh, this opportunity under SABSTA is very important 
um, I myself for one would really urge the countries and the various different parties to continue to engage strongly uh, we see for instance in the in the in the last um, uh, uh, substa here in Bonn uh, that uh, there was expression by parties of some of the areas where there is a, a lack of understanding uh, in, the, in the, the area that was commissioned for assessment related to extreme events. Uh, there was a little understanding of the triggers and the indicators for how early warning systems and, and, and how we can achieve contingency planning for food security. Uh, we had active questions of uh, you know, regional uh, groups that are affected by regional phenomena, let's say for example the, the drought in the Horn of Africa uh, groups, they, they come out very strongly to say that they need uh, certainly technical cooperation in how they can address uh, and, 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 and continue to refine uh, data sets uh, and access to data that allows them to then um, uh, formulate these triggers and indicators that can help uh, to understand uh, more in depth uh, uh, the phenomena around uh, early warning systems for and, and contingency planning for food security. Um, the the just the lack of capacity at the regional and sub-regional uh, levels uh, is is becoming a very um, a, a active area of convergence within the talks. Uh, understanding uh, not just how to treat uh, uh, emerging. Um, Imagine uh, data uh, on, on and how to use this in terms of monitoring early warning systems, uh, but also how to build the capacity to sustain that uh, at the regional level. And it's becoming very important that uh, other regions of the world that have made advances, for example, the Americas, for example, the Europeans, for example, uh, Asia and the Pacific in, in uh, designing early warning systems, share that information much more closely in terms of technical cooperation of the, uh, uh, programs and agreements with other regions such as Africa that are, that are still much uh, less so covered by those uh, sorts of uh, early warning systems. Next slide, please. Um, in, 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 in this uh, next slide, I think also we are hearing uh, the contribution from the parties, uh, the, there is uh, interest uh, for support of implementation of uh, systems for inventory and documentation uh, that uh, tie what we know about these early warning systems with food security in Africa, but there's also added uh, benefit in terms of bridging knowledge gaps in understanding how there is variation between interannual and interseasonal characteristics of rainfall and how these are linked to indigenous knowledge systems uh, which is very important in, uh, in uh, the um, uh, South America, Latin America, Africa and parts of Asia. And so really a common and shared protocol around how to bridge those knowledge gaps in terms of understanding, let's say for example, the monsoon in India and its characteristics uh, can then be scaled up through South-South collaborations and uh, South-South programs of, uh, of, um, of, of intervention. Uh, and I think countries are beginning to express really an interest to work together through that sort of, that sort of an approach. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, technology transfer and capacity building for the use uh, and uptake of technology. We are hearing the countries are discussing actively. Uh, we know that there are differences uh, between countries and, 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 and you can, um, uh, it's, it's, it's very clear that those in the north have made uh, uh, much more progress uh, in terms of integrating technology as part of the agriculture production process much less so in the south and we're seeing more and more interest uh, especially now with the added uh, challenge of climate change we're seeing more interest on how we can build synergies on how we can exchange and, and, and help the countries uh, in the south uh, get access to uh, data 
tools and approaches for not just downscaling the climate applications themselves and how to un and, and using those how to understand extreme uh, uh, weather phenomena but also to go ahead and integrate that as part of the national planning processes as part of uh, a, a, a interventions that uh, provide for investments in agriculture uh, be they large scale uh, uh, infrastructure investments or be they investments that uh, are likely to result uh, in benefits to large large parts of the populations. So I th think what we're seeing those two are being tied very closely. There is the discussion of how this technology can be transferred across regions and there is also discussion of how we can cooperate in, in, in terms of building capacity for technology transfer. Next slide. Now, uh, one track, one discussion track, one negotiation track that uh, a lot of parties are interested in uh, and that is uh, causing quite a bit of, uh, a, you know, um, interest within the UNSCC process itself and also outside uh, the UNSCC process is the, is the finance uh, and how we can provide financial support, uh, not just for um, for uh, uh, you know investments in uh, in uh, programs for uh, extreme weather related managing extreme uh, weather events and hazards associated with those, uh, supporting risk detection and emergency response, uh, but also in investing in long term programs. Um, and, and I would like to take this opportunity perhaps uh, to just quickly uh, mention some of the some of the examples of short uh, medium and long-term financing mechanisms that could be available for countries uh, that can form the basis uh, for discussion within the UNFCC and also for cooperative agreements outside of the UNFCC process uh, we're seeing that uh, in terms of um, what the countries are doing, uh, we're seeing there is now mainstreaming that is allowing countries to tap into national budgetary resources, uh, which are very critical for addressing immediate climate-related risks in the countries. Uh, and we're seeing that uh, budgetary funds are now being mainstreamed into medium-term planning, uh, as well as uh, other sustainable funding mechanisms for climate change action. Uh, we're seeing uh, increased interest and participation of the private sector, uh, private sector funds and bonds, uh, which are now uh, may, may, many of them that are driven by uh, uh, market mechanisms in instances where the private sector is, is taking an active role in financing new, um, uh, uh, new um, uh, 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 approaches or investments. Uh, in uh, in uh, climate uh, uh, resilient uh, uh, agriculture, um, uh, the the third area which is which is uh, actively being discussed not just within the UNFCC itself but also outside of the UNFCC, these are concessionary mechanisms which have been very instrumental in building and investing in infrastructure projects. Uh, for example, in uh, in uh, operate uh, build operate and transfer schemes, uh, which could be used to drive climate related investments, where concessionary agreements can be successfully negotiated. Uh, the other area that we're seeing that is very active uh, in the talks itself uh, is uh, bilateral and multilateral funding, uh, where uh, you know uh, f funding mechanisms that are negotiated. Uh, it can 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 result in actually uh, what we call a additional need uh, to support climate change adaptation, bringing climate action into new borrowing and lending instruments. Um, th this is closely coupled with the global adaptation funds, which have specific windows to provide for support for countries and other relative entities, such as with the Green Climate Fund and the Adaptation Fund. And, and lastly, I wanted to, to mention also that there is funding uh, that, um, that uh, could, could be available through the emerging markets and other investment funds that provides potential streams for innovative startup ventures 
including linking agriculture with uh, renewable energy projects. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I will sort of uh, wind up my presentation one by saying that a lot of the submissions that are going into the into uh, building these areas under the UNFC, uh, building the discussions on agriculture under the UNFCC substar are available. You can download those. Uh, you can see some of them on this slide. Next slide, please. But I really wanted to to conclude. By, by saying that even though we see that there are various strands of work already underway on agriculture within the UNFCC, UNFCC process, I wanted to make the remark that it is especially important that these efforts be strengthened and linked closely together to ensure that a 2015 agreement does, does not close the door on agriculture. Next slide, please. Now, if you look at already uh, the work that the countries are doing, uh, many countries we see have included agriculture in their national plans. I think Peter talked about this uh, as uh, by, by, by 2012, we, we, we see that at least 21 of those have officially submitted their nationally appropriate mitigation actions uh, that refer to agricultural activities and at least 30 developing countries have expressed interest in implementing agricultural NAMAS. Next slide please. Now comes the now comes the 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 uh, new regime uh, with uh, countries also developing national adaptation plans uh, within the UNFCC, uh, where these plans allow for countries to address climate vulnerability and build their capacity to adapt to current and future climatic changes. Uh, but where a key focus really is to integrate climate change adaptation into development planning, and so we are anticipating that agriculture, since most countries are specifying, as we saw on the previous slide, that uh, agriculture is really part of their, their, their big mitigation, uh, mitigation effort, that this will be provided for under the adaptation, uh, adaptation framework in many of these countries, and, 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 and it provides an opportunity and a platform to build synergies between adaptation and mitigation. And lastly, uh, we see, next slide, lastly, we see that uh, negotiations are currently now covering voluntary offers by countries towards achieving the goals of a new climate change agreement, uh, and these are known as the intended nationally determined uh, contributions. Uh, we anticipate and we expect going into Paris that these should contribute to economy-wide efforts to reduce emissions, as well as provide for adaptation action that brings on board many of the efforts that we have talked about under agriculture. So we are anticipating to see that agriculture is going to be reflected across the board, both in terms of any annexes the countries are providing as adaptation efforts, in terms of the the uh, the, the contributions that the countries are uh, that are provided that the countries are providing to reduce emissions. Uh, mainstreaming that into their own development process through the NAPS and also in general ensuring that agriculture is going to tap into existing and future climate finance instruments. And so with those few remarks uh, I would like to say thank you for allowing me to to contribute to this seminar. And back to you Annette. Thank you, James, for this very interesting presentation. And I think that we are now all um, much more informed about the substar process and the, and the technical submissions. Um, so before I hand over to Michael Howell, I would just like to hear if there are any specific questions of clarification for Peter and James, and then you can type it into the chat box, and we will select uh, a few questions for both of them. Um, so please go ahead and, and type into the chat box if you have any questions. So I have uh, a first question here, uh, and that one is for Peter Iverson. So on one slide, uh, the one that is called It Can Be Done, you discuss overlaps. Uh, can you elaborate on these overlaps and explain why they might be a problem? I 
And I'm just going to see if we have another question coming in. Um, otherwise, I can hand over to Peter to answer that question while we wait to see if there is a f there are a few more questions of clarification. So I see Peter, but I'm not sure we have sound yet. Okay, yeah, I think I hope it works now. Um, yes. So yeah, what I mean is that as I, I in the first part of my presentation, I mentioned that agriculture, for example, is being dealt with sometimes also under the Nairobi Work Program. Um, so I think. There, there will always be this, con so if we talk about agriculture and particular adaptation and agriculture, then there would perhaps also be um, some uh, parties that would uh, say that this is, we are already discussing this under the Nairobi work program, so we don't want to have the same discussion also in another forum. So I think this is, um, I mean, if there's a particular work program in agriculture, probably what over time would happen would be that the other four, like the Ruby Work Program, for example, will stop discussing agriculture because then they will say, now this is being discussed under the work program. I think the parties would, uh, would avoid to have something that could look like the same discussion in two different four, uh, even if it's, I mean, well, of course at the same meeting, but also in just meetings following each other because they will say this is a bit redundant. So that's what I mean. Um, it has to it has to be defined in a sort of specific and unique way. This uh, agricultural work program to to ensure that okay, this is what we discuss here, and either we don't uh, we change what we discuss somewhere else so we don't overlap, or we we define it in a way that we are sure that it doesn't overlap. Thank you, Peter, for that clarification. And uh, question number two, and I think that uh, Peter and James, you will have to see which one of you would be most comfortable answering this question. So can initiatives outside the UNFCCC, such as the SDG process on the Sustainable Development Goals, help move the agenda on agriculture within the UNFCCC? If I may. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, for sure. I mean, if things are, if it's being highlighted in another uh, forum and parties uh, can take it from there, but it always has to be parties that brings it into the UNFCCC. I mean, a, a, a forum like the, what's this, uh, I mean, can cannot uh, bring it to the UNFCCC. I mean, you can have let's say uh, a program or a UN agency can have it, their submission, but really to propose things to be discussed, then it, it's, uh, I mean, it will always be stronger if it's parties that are bringing it in, I would say. Thank you, Peter. And I can add also, Annette? Yes, please, James, go ahead. Okay, so I think that's a very important question, and I think uh, one of the points that is being made right now is to actually say that we need to be cognizant of other important global processes where, they, where the parties are participating outside of the UNFCC framework. And we need to, 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 to synchronize uh, what's happening within the UNFCC or what's being discussed by the parties uh, as part of the the, the larger development uh, development agenda, and so related to agriculture, I wanted to to flag goal number two. Actually, explicitly talks about uh, the SDG. I mean, the Sustainable Development Goal number two talks about ending hunger, achieving food security, improving nutrition, and promoting sustainable agriculture, and that speaks directly to Article two of the Convention which says that whatever we do in terms of cutting emission must not threaten food security. So I think, as Peter mentioned, I think the, it needs to be highlighted from, from an evidence point of view that, uh, that the countries need to actively uh, bring that part of the discussion from the SDGs 
uh, to inform whatever is being discussed under the UNFCC stream. So I think the two processes need to be linked. Thank you, James. Um, and although we do have uh, more questions, in the interest of time, I would like to hand over to Michael Howell to go through um, the, the Farming First uh, CCAF CTA toolkit uh, to the climate change negotiations, and then we will have time after Michael's presentation to take more questions. So, Michael, please go ahead. Great. Um, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for, for tuning in today to the webinar. I think it's a really important topic and um, in particular to, to Annette and Vanessa for taking the lead on organizing the webinar, so thank you for that. Um, I am presenting to you with a slightly different role. You've heard from um, Peter, who is obviously a former negotiator, and also from James, who is um, you know, leading CCAF's efforts in terms of research. Um, and my background is as a communicator, so I'd like to hopefully um, segue into how we actually take the experiences of people like Peter and James and translate that or communicate that so that um, the messages are, uh, are more effective and they reach the audiences that they need to reach. So um, in that capacity, uh, uh, I'm coordinating the efforts of an agricultural coalition called Farming First. Um, which is a global agricultural coalition that has about 180 organizations uh, as supporters from all around the world. Uh, you should be able to hopefully see my screen um, so you can see more about uh, Farming First on, on our website. Um, but one of the important things that Farming First aims to do is build consensus around agriculture's role uh, in sustainable development and in this case um, agriculture's role in addressing climate change. Uh, based on what we've heard, th th we have uh, quite a, a range of um, expertise and experiences and also um, uh, job specs, if you will, um, in our audience. So forgive me if I'm going through basics um, or, or communications tactics that might not be relevant for some of you. Um, I've been interacting with the UNFCCC process for about eight years as a communicator and it's one of the most challenging topics to address as a communications person because climate change is often seen as something um, very abstract and also something very focused on the future. And so I think one of the challenges is in fact trying to make it more immediate, more urgent and, and more concrete. Um, but it's also to try to pool resources that are available so that we have the best information available to us um, to, to use when we're communicating and advocating. So um, if you go to the Farming First website, if any of you are interested, here under climate change, um, we have a, a resource that's been developed in conjunction with um, CCAFs and CTA. And I'd really like to primarily use this time to go through uh, the, the toolkit uh, so that you can see this as a resource um, when you're actually planning any communications, advocacy, capacity building exercises um, in the lead up to this Paris uh, climate talk or, or in fact any future uh, meetings that are taking place. So you know, broadly speaking from a communications perspective I think if we're starting here at the beginning of this chain, the first thing that's really important to, um, is to actually get more familiar with the process. Um, today's presentations by Peter and James I think are a great um, starting point for that. Uh, and I think it's important from, from you know, to, to understand what we're talking about before we go about um, doing that. Then I think it's about getting your facts straight. So getting the data and the, the evidence to, and, and rather also the expertise to, to substantiate your claims. Then it's actually illustrating it with wider examples. Uh, then it's building the confidence to actually start to engage uh, and, and then also amplify it through various communications channels. You know, you do that through building out key messages, that allow you to reach out to policymakers or other audiences, um, and also as a communicator, be more uh, 
comfortable in addressing some of the challenging questions or being able to direct them to others in your organization more effectively. So please use this uh, toolkit as a resource. It's, the, it's, it's been built for exactly that purpose. Um, but in particular, I think for, for a lot of you who are just getting your head around the, this process, the number of acronyms, the number of terms, the complexity of the challenges, dealing with food security concerns versus mitigation versus adaptation, um, it, it can be very challenging. Um, and so I'd, I'd really like to um, flag some of these, some of these um, aspects of the toolkit in particular. The first is we have an update on agriculture in the UNFCCC. So a lot of this will actually go through similar uh, topics that, uh, that James and Peter discussed, but it's here for you as a resource now that you can use and that you can uh, read and, 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 and go through in your own time. Uh, it goes through a lot of the acronyms, a lot of the, 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 the processes that um, underpin the, the advances in the, in the climate negotiations. Um, and it's particularly helpful, I think, for, for those of you who are trying to get your heads around this for the first time. In, uh, in addition, we, in addition to the toolkit, Farming First also, um, in conjunction with CCAFs and CTA, has developed a, a, an infographic that actually shows the timeline of the negotiations. So if I may, I might just jump over and show that to you as well. Um, the toolkit is accessed here. The infographic is accessed here. And it gives some interesting statistics um, related to agriculture and climate change, but then also I think very helpfully it goes through some of the process um, historically to show why it is that why it is and how it is that we've gotten to where we are now in 2015. So I'll just jump back now to the toolkit and um, really I think for, for the majority of this time I'd like to just focus on, because the rest of this is mostly resources, I'd like to focus on what we're calling um, the, the fact sheets. And we have a number of, uh, of key messages that, we're, that we've developed that hopefully will help you in engaging. So as an organization, when you're thinking about how you're going to engage around the UNFCCC process, I think it's important to first ask yourself what your objectives are. And uh, some organizations have an advocacy mandate. And so they're actually trying to um, impact the, 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 the agenda and the text itself. Um, others are trying to share their experiences of running development programs on the ground or doing research. And others are even just trying to learn or engage or, or, or uh, you know, make connections through the process. Uh, whatever it is that your, your objectives are, uh, it's, under, it's important to come up with key messages that help uh, underpin what, what those what that position is. Um, the first one here that we have um, is uh, now is the time to act. Farmers are experiencing the impacts of climate change and they need action if they are to adapt and to mitigate. Uh, this is really to communicate the fact that, uh, that there's a sense of urgency and that farmers are actually already experiencing the impacts of climate change uh, now. Um, it's not a, a hypothetical future situation. In each of these messages that we have under the resource, we also give some additional information as well as some key statistics that have all been referenced. Um, this is hopefully helpful to you all um, when you're doing writing, when you are having conversations uh, in the lead up to, to the climate talks. Our second message. A 2015 agreement should acknowledge the importance of agriculture for food security and livelihoods and the role it can play to help meet global adaptation and mitigation goals. So there are some openings in, in, the, in the text right now for agriculture to play a role. As Peter suggested, uh, you know, a lot of this will actually play out uh, next year um, in, in the 2016 sub-stub, but uh, the foundations are there in, in the current text for, for this to happen. So we want to reinforce that. Um, we give a lot more information here that I won't go through in, in, in depth, but I encourage you to read through it when you have a, a spare moment.
our third three key message. Uh, the zero draft of the 2015 agreement, which was released in February, includes mentions of both the land sector and agriculture. Um, this is, uh, as far as I know, it's a, it's a first and it's a positive development um, for ne and negotiators should keep agriculture included as the negotiating text evolves. And the process set up under Substa in June 2014 for submissions and workshops over the next two years is welcome. It's progress on adaptation specifically, but it needs to feed into the ADP discussions so that a global framework for action from 2020 includes agriculture. As you can see, with all of these messages, they're substantiated with more facts. And you can also pull out more information that we've collected here in terms of videos, farmer quotes, um, pre press quotes, case studies, infographics, and websites. Uh, so the fifth message, a 2015 agreement should deploy finance, technical inputs, and capacity building to support ambitious actions by farmers and the agricultural sector to achieve food security through adaptation and mitigation. Um, this is something that James um, touched on in, in his presentation already. Um, so we'll keep going here. Um, again, as James discussed, um, the, the INDCs, the Intended Nationally Determined Contributions by Countries, represent a key opportunity to bring agriculture into climate change commitments and activities, uh, and agriculture must be included in the INDCs. As, as James, mentioned, James mentioned already, this is already um, happening, um, and there is potential there as well. Next, message seven, um, agriculture and food security issues are likely to be central to planning for mitigation, um, including the, the, the mitigation, the NAMAs, and the adaptation of the NAPAs in all countries. I'll just quickly go through the rest here. Agriculture and food security issues are likely to be central to planning for mitigation. Oops. National policy processes will work best if they combine food security, adaptation, and mitigation rather than keeping the three aspects in separate tracks. Integration is needed across landscapes and food supply chains in order to manage trade-offs effectively, particularly trade-offs between food production and mitigation goals. Financing must be part of climate change policies. Recent developments are positive. Improvements in the global environment facility strategy and an increase in financing stemming from Fast Start Finance are helping increase funding towards climate smart agriculture, but more needs to be done. And it's essential that the new Green Climate Fund provides stable long-term support to adaptation and mitigation in, ad in agriculture. Um, Peter discussed the Green Climate Fund um, in his presentation already. Um, there's promise there that um, in their next board meeting uh, in November that, um, that agriculture might actually be considered more specifically in that. And I think um, from a communications and advocacy perspective, um, there's the possibility to elaborate on that, give um, evidence and, and, and examples for why that should be and, and how it could work. And lastly, on the, 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 the fact sheets with the key messages. Um, as communicators, and particularly um, if we are, if you're involved in an organization that is actually doing work on the ground or conducting research on the ground, it's important to communicate the fact that um, there are solutions to some of these challenges that already exist, um, and they can be scaled up. So we have information and solutions around improved soil and water management practices, um, around better climate information services, uh, greater access to agricultural resources for among women. Uh, and we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel uh, when we are engaging around this. It's, it's often the case that we just need to package up the experiences um, and the successes that we've had uh, and share them more widely and also create the incentives for farmers to, to make use of them. So um, this is really uh, an overview. Um, I, it's difficult to go through the entire toolkit um, all at once, but I encourage you to use it the way that you see fit, because uh, you know, uh, 
it's a great resource. You can also download as a PDF the entire guide here, which I'll just show you quickly. Um, it just goes through the exact same information, but it's helpful if you want it as a printout or put it on your computer when you're not online. Um, it gives the exact same information with, uh, with, with all the relevant links. Uh, again, this is the, this is the infographic. Uh, we have hard copies of this as well from Fermi First. You can uh, message me if you're interested in receiving some hard copies. Uh, and then just to, just to talk about some of the experiences I've had actually uh, you know, uh, co communicating around climate change the past eight years. Some of the most effective things that you can do is, is, is to figure out how you are, um, how, how groups in the uh, agricultural sector are, this, are similar. And uh, Peter discussed the, the, the fact that, uh, that uh, that the cop um, in Durban or head of Durban was uh, wanting a was going to propose a work program, um, something that Farming First helped lead um, uh, that in the lead up to that discussion was to actually come up with a joint call to action um, that we published as an open letter, um, and we received very good uh, media coverage and visibility f for that. So one thing that I would suggest doing as as uh, as communicators is to look around you and see if there are like-minded organizations or networks like Farming First or CCAPS or CTA um, who, who could partner with you uh, in, order to, uh, in order to share a common message to negotiators. Uh, we find that the more negotiators are able to hear a consistent, uh, coherent message, um, the more able they are to act with uh, confidence that um, this is what the agriculture sector is prioritizing, this is what the agriculture sector wants. Uh, I just want to showcase um, one other article here um, that was actually written by um, Annette Fries, who's uh, moderating the webinar today. But um, it's also clear; it's also important that we uh, that we communicate very clearly what our concerns are, and that we don't uh, beat around the bush in, in doing that. So, if uh, if we are concerned that agriculture is being sidelined or not being uh, uh, included in in the in the negotiations in the way that we see fit, we have to be clear about that, and we have to take a, a strong view. Um, I really commend Annette for taking a strong view. This was um, ahead of the uh, the Poland COP two years ago, um, but actually, you know, taking a very personal position um, and talking about the experiences she had in Warsaw um, with the negotiations and the frustrations around. Um, not being able to get a substitute work program um, um, in place. So I think with that, um, I'll, I'll stop. I, I, I actually would like to make sure that we have enough time for a Q&A because I'm just as interested to hear about uh, what all of you are planning ahead of this COP and to see if there are ways that we could actually collaborate um, in, the, in, the, in the lead up to the coming months. So thanks very much. Thank you, Michael, for this presentation and for taking us through the toolkit. Uh, this is absolutely useful. So we will go into the question and answer session now, and I will try to use two different computers for this, so if I'm moving a bit back and forth, that is why. So I will take uh, two, three questions at a time and then ask our panelists to, uh, to address these questions. Um, and also to all of you attending, uh, if you have questions for the panelists, please type them into the chat box and, and we will then select from there. As I imagine, we will have too many questions for, this, uh, half, for the half hour we have left for question and answers. So let me start with um, a question for James from Rupak Mandvatka. Um, in potential sources of finance, you mentioned emerging market funds. Could you specify which ones you think uh, these would be? And also roughly, when do you estimate these fund concepts would develop? Um. And James, I'm just going to take a few questions and then uh, I will hand it over to all of you to respond. So the second question is a question from Rico Kongsaya. 
how will UNFCCC avoid leakage um, by the countries when working with the agricultural sector if one country reduces emissions from agriculture and thereby also their production? Um, so they will most likely increase their food import and thereby increase emissions elsewhere. So, so this is a question about carbon leakage. So let me pause from these two questions and if uh, let me know if, if I was really across the border and then the emissions will be the same. So, so it is a real concern. I think the I mean part of the solution is of course that we can also uh, produce and uh, reduce emissions at the same time. It, it's not all, I mean you can imagine mitigation that will reduce production of course, but you can also, there's quite a few options for mitigation that will not necessarily reduce uh, production. Uh, and, and those of course, in, in that case you don't have any carbon leakage, then you can uh, reduce emissions because you basically are, are applying your fertilizer in a smarter way for example. Uh, if you uh, have uh, your livestock in a in a way where where you can handle the manure in a smarter way and and so on, so there's it's not all mitigation that necessarily lead to to a leakage, but but overall it is uh, it is of course uh, a concern and um, and I think as we move, I mean, uh, as as uh, I mean by 2030 and so on, when when agricultural mission will contribute a lot. Probably at that time, we, I mean, I don't expect this is the UNFCCC to do that, but I think people by themselves will have to ask, okay, what, how much, uh, I mean, because meat tend to be more uh, climate, uh, I mean, causing more emissions compared to if, if you are uh, not eating meat. So I guess uh, in for people individually, they would also start to ask, okay, maybe we have to cut down also on, uh, on the amount of meat we eat we are consuming, um, but, but yeah, it is an interesting topic. Thank you, Peter. Um, so we have another question, but before I move on to that question, I just want to remind the audience to please type your questions into, into the question or the chat box and send it to all entire audience so that we can see the questions. Thank you. So the next question is from Elvin Chandra. For the smallholder farmers in developing countries, reducing emissions is not a priority. Um, what then are the entire points and benefits for them? So I am thinking then that if we look at uh, agriculture in the UNFCCC negotiations and, and compare in, in, in the terms of reducing emissions, then what what why would smallholder farmers want to engage in that? Uh, James, I think there's maybe a question that would be well put for yeah. you. Yeah, I, I. This is another very interesting question. I, and I think. I, I I think I hear it more often that reducing emissions is not a priority for smallholder farmers, but. I usually like to take the question also the other way around, that nearly everything that the small-scale farmers are doing is in one way or another going to contribute to reducing um, uh, green, greenhouse gas emissions. So if you say, for example, if you take, for example, sustainable land management, if they're apply, applying technologies like, uh, you know, harvesting water and using that water to irrigate to irrigate and raise crops. If they are collecting manure and using that manure, it's adding carbon to the soil. If they are uh, using water more judiciously in their rice fields and they are cutting waste, they are actually contributing to reductions in emissions of nitrous oxides from rice, rice fields. So I, I think it's a question of we need to understand more what are, which are the areas where you have synergies between what you do in terms of adapting to climate change and climate variability and what you do in terms of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. So it's it's more a question of as we continue to work with smallholder farmers to make sure that we secure food food we, we that that their food secure 
all of those changes that they're making in the practices are in one way or another contributing to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change. So I think we need methods, we need to understand, we need to to bring out and highlight the evidence of what smallholder farmers are doing to mitigate the negative impacts of climate change in order that the whole uh, approach may be taken in a holistic way where you, you actually take those aspects of technologies that you are applying for adaptation and those aspects of technologies that you are applying for mitigation in a holistic manner. So I, I, I think it's really an argument of not of one or either, it's an argument of how do you make sure that the two approaches in terms of mitigation and adaptation are speaking to each other. Thank you, James. And we have a follow-up uh, to this question asking, um, in the UNFCCC process, is mitigation actually an entry point to supporting adaptation programs? Uh, again, I, I would urge that, and I think Michael presented this very, he was very articulate in his presentation, and I think uh, Peter also uh, has mentioned uh, that earlier on when he gave uh, his presentation. I think we need to to not treat the two as separate tracks uh, and, and they can also contribute if they agree with that but we need to we need to understand that there that that there are synergies between adaptation and mitigation so for instance if you look and we we are still going to get the full analysis of what the INDCs look like but some of the INDCs that I have seen that highlight agriculture as a possible area of investment in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, following the approach of making sure that we apply more renewable technologies in the production process and that we reduce our emissions intensity, I see a lot of those are already putting an annex of adaptation actions. So there would be excellent examples of where countries are saying, hey, look, it's not just about mitigation. It is also about what we are doing in adaptation in order to, de to, to, to deliver mitigation benefits. So I, I, I think and my, my colleagues can, can, can come in um, if, if they would like to support that line of thought. Thank you. Yeah, Thank if, you. If yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, yes, I, I agree very much, actually. Uh, mitigation, uh, of course, depending on how effectively uh, we, mit we mitigate, we will need uh, more or less adaptation. I mean, I think we are already in a situation where we need to adapt quite a lot with where we are now. But at the same time, it also goes the other way around. The more we, the better we can adapt, in particular in agriculture, the more we are actually also mitigating uh, at the same time, these are so interlinked, and I, I'm very happy you brought up uh, uh, the word uh, synergies because actually this is really one of the also one of the key words that has come up in the negotiations all the time on agriculture is that there is a lot of synergy between these these two different uh, uh, lines of thinking, mitigation and uh, adaptation. Uh, a lot of activities you can highlight that actually can promote both adaptation and mitigation at the, exactly the same time to the benefit of the farmer, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Michael, um, uh, perhaps you want to come in as well. Um, just, just very quickly, um, I, I agree with, I agree with uh, both of those points, and I think from a communications perspective, um, it's, it, 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 it's very easy to retreat to a very simple or simplistic message around adaptation or mitigation or food security. And um, while simple messages in communications terms are good, they have to also be accurate and they have to reflect what our overall objectives are. So I um, really suggest that, that we find ways to communicate the complexity of the, the, the solution set here. Um, in a way that looks at mitigation, adaptation, food security concerns um, as interconnected. And obviously, um, you know, grab for the low-hanging fruit where there are synergies, but also, you know, let's be honest and talk about where there are trade-offs as well. 
because that, from a communications perspective, also helps you know negotiators like Peter to to do their jobs more effectively. Thank you, Michael, and all of you. So, my apologies. I'm trying to read the questions here. So, um, and I also must apologize if I pronounce your names. Uh, incorrectly as that is a real danger here. So uh, the next question is from Lucas McQuiso from the Social Vision Group of Tan in Tanzania. What are the strategies to ensure that COP21 decisions will truly benefit local farmers? And I think that in the interest of time perhaps I will take one more question to follow up from that. And that question is from Paulina Bisotto Molino, Molina. How, to, how do we ensure sufficient financing for adaptation and how can we overcome pol polarization between small scale and big business approaches to agriculture adaptation and mitigation in COP21? And let me see. So I, so I think that I will take these two questions now, and then we have a few more questions following from that. So who would want to start responding to those two questions? So you want me to respond to the first one, Annette? Please go ahead, James. Yeah, how will COP1 decisions benefit local farmers in Tanzania? Um, so. So I, I think we, we need to start by understanding what is the main focus of COP21. The main focus of COP21 is parties coming together to agree on a deal that will take us through a new climate regime. Uh, I, I, I think there are several ways that one could respond to that question, but I think what what we must highlight is that a lot of what will be said in Paris will be related to what the countries themselves will do in order to keep global warming within two degrees or whatever number of degrees they agree on. Now, uh, if that is the case, then the specific actions that are going to lead to that goal or that target being achieved are actually going to be pledged by the various different parties to the agreement. And so I would like to, to respond to the, to the uh, question from Tanzania to say the starting point should be what does the government of Tanzania intend to present as the actions that they pledge towards contributing to, a glo to the global agreement that will in turn make sure that all of the programs that are being developed by the government of Tanzania are responding to the needs of the smallholder farmers in Tanzania. So I think that's where there is the opportunity to build that argument that the smallholder farmers in Tanzania will work with the with the government uh, the uh, government of the United Republic of Tanzania to ensure that whatever commitments that the government makes under the UNFCC agreement respond to the needs of the local farmers in Tanzania. Thank you, James. So can I ask one of you to respond to the second question as well on how to ensure sufficient financing for adaptation and to overcome polarization between small scale and big business approaches to agriculture adaptation and mitigation in COP21? Well, I could try. Um, it's a, I mean, this is a difficult uh, question, sufficient financing. I think financing is very high up on the agenda at the discussions uh, and probably also after Paris we will have a situation where we can claim there will not be sufficient financing. Hopefully there will be a lot, but uh, sufficient I think probably we will never get to that uh, place that there will be sufficient. Uh, so there will always need to uh, be a need to prioritize um, and I, I don't foresee that uh, the negotiations will establish. I mean, they have just the Green Climate Fund is just becoming operational and will start uh, to award um, funding to, to to various adaptation and and 
also mitigation projects. Uh, and I think actually this is the place, not really at COP21, where so it's like places like the Green Climate Fund, where where they will sort of uh, have a lot of uh, influence on 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 how to divide the we could say the available financing, including how it will be between small scale and big scale. And of course, the Green Climate Fund is dependent on what kind of applications they will uh, receive uh, for funding. So again, this brings it back to countries and uh, wh how they would want to, um, to what kind of activities and what kind of funding they would try to ask for. So I think COP21 will deal with uh, sort of financing Overall, how much where will it come from, but but the um, how it will be used, I think that will probably uh, the the Green Climate Fund, I think, is is a more relevant uh, place where we will see that over the coming years. I mean, and there is already, of course, some decisions for the Green Climate Fund, the division between adaptation and mitigation, and the division, I mean, the certain percentage for the least developed countries, etc. So. Uh, there are also already some things that <clears throat> the Green Climate Funds have to take into account. I don't think this, the COP21 will go into that kind of discussion. If, if I may as well, um, just, just to talk about the, the, the polarization between small, small farming and, and, and big farming. Um, again, I think it, it goes back to, it's a framing, it's a framing challenge. Um, there's a temptation to see agriculture as a homogenous sector. And to try to get from a communications perspective, try to paint a picture of one kind of farm that is the solution, and um, it, it's just not the reality. Um, different regions, different di different agroecological zones, different um, institutional uh, you know setups, um, different histories, different cultures require um, different types of farming systems. And I think again, from a comms perspective. Uh, you know, painting the heterogeneity of farming, of agriculture as a sector, allows space for both types of farming to exist and to be complementary to, to, the, to the context, the local context that it's operating in. You wouldn't have the same farming right now in the, in the U.S. as you would in East Africa. Um, and we have to avoid the temptation to, to polarize ourselves on one side or the other for, um, for, as a false sort of positioning um, uh, for advocacy. Thank you to all of you for these responses. So let me move on to uh, and take a couple of more questions. So um, a question from Keris Jones from the World Farmers Organization. Uh, Keris asks if, we ha if there is any advice on where to focus communications efforts if you have multiple objectives. Uh, and want to engage negotiators, want to share information, want to raise awareness more widely, uh, widely, etc. Um, yep. I think. Uh, so I have yes. Please go ahead, Michael, and then we will take the next one. Um, first of all, it's great to see uh, it's great to see the World Farmers Organization here on the webinar. They're one of um, our, our Farming First um, uh, founding members, and they're on Farming First steering committee. So um, welcome and thanks for joining. Um, uh, we can certainly take this uh, offline as well, Cerise, if, you, if you'd like, so you can always email me and we can chat about this more. But um, it's, in a nutshell, it's um, understand your objectives very clearly, and it's not your communications objectives, but it's your advocacy and, uh, you, it's your advocacy and policy objectives that you want to understand. From there, I think you, you want to take a look at the landscape around you of other organizations that are engaging around this process. And um, essentially, try to find out where the World Farmers Organization is differentiated compared to other groups. What is it that you can talk about and um, should talk about that others, for instance, CCAFs or the World Bank or uh, Oxfam, can, cannot as credibly? Um, to me, it's you know, as a farmers organization, you know, carrying the the torch of farmers, um, sharing their voice, seems like an intuitive one to me. Um, and then also, I think it's uh, figuring out where you can align your efforts and lend lend your brand, lend your voice, so that um, there are synergies in 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 the communications outreach that's being done. And I hope that um, you know that's partly through Farming First this year. Thank you, Michael. 
Uh, would any of the other panelists want to come in, Peter, James? Well, I, I could maybe just say, uh, as a negotiator, how I see the um, influence of uh, not only agriculture but for different topics, uh, how it becomes more effectively. I think actually quite a bit of accuracy could be happened before the COP itself because really as, uh, so I have been negotiating uh, in the UNFCCC on uh, behalf of Denmark and really if, if we have the Danish Farmers Organization to say something, this will have an influence on my minister and that of course will have an influence on how I would negotiate. If we wait until the COP itself, then positions are already formed and so on. So I think quite, I mean to have uh, effect, it's quite important actually to go through the national uh, organizations and, and, and thereby have, have some influence. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Annette. I, I think not to stretch the question. I think it, it's, it's a function of how much of that narrative and that debate is shared at the national level with the people who are going to be responsible to come and make the negotiating arguments. And so that's really where the key messages should be expanded and should be debated and the merits and the merits of those messages should be conceptualized at that national level in those national constituencies so that there is more meaningful exchange when the negotiations actually take place because then people are exchanging from a point of information uh, and so I think really communication should really be focused on highlighting those sorts of constituencies and, and promoting exchange in those sorts of constituencies. Thank you so much. So I have uh, at least one more question here, so let's take that one. And it is from Melissa Rojas Downing about livestock. So livestock is known to be one of the agricultures, uh, to be the part of the agriculture sex sector that mostly contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. Is this already being discussed in the UNFCCC to better adapt and mitigate? And how much importance is given to the livestock sector? Yeah, James, so, would you like to start? <laughs> yeah, so that's another very difficult one. And then I also to say that, you know, there's within the agriculture negotiating streams, I think the way it is structured is such that uh, parties do not, um, you know, discuss the specific subsectors like that. Let's say, for example, the livestock sector or the rice sector or the wheat sector or they do not discuss those. I think they remain on the principles. The discussion is on the principles of how can we rationalize uh, greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture knowing that you know the, the, the technical analysis can help us to partition the sources between livestock, between crops, between water use, between waste management, and and so that's that, that that's a function of saying, let us remain on the principles and discuss how we can mitigate emissions coming from the agriculture sector, than to say let's discuss the specific uh, technical analysis. I think uh, many many countries in in. South America would probably like to look at the livestock sector as a, as a possible area of reductions in emissions. Um, a few other countries in Europe I think would like to look at that. Some countries in Asia may have that as a focus. So, so, so to say not everyone will have that as a focus because others will be focusing on rice systems, others will be focusing on forest-based systems, uh, others will be focusing on uh, on uh, marine and fisheries and aquaculture, uh, and so I think within the negotiations, let us remain on the principles of how we achieve the goals rather than the the te technical analysis themselves. Thank you, James. Um, so I think that that we're about to reach uh, the end of this webinar, so uh, just 
before we 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 close this uh, discussion that I think has been very fruitful and very helpful. Um, I just want to ask our panelists if you have uh, if you want to say a few words as a as a wrap up. So, uh, Michael, perhaps we start with you now, if you would like to say a few things, and sure. also if you want to respond to the to the latest question that we had. Thanks. Uh, sure. Um, I mean, I, from from a communications perspective, what I hope you take out um, of this from my contribution is is really the resources that exist on the Farming First website um, for climate change. Um, there is more there than we could communicate in two hours, and please use that as a resource or get in touch with me if you if you want to chat more about it. Um, the takeaways for me are um, have a clear objective in mind for what you're doing. Um, don't try to overdo it. Uh, and uh, be concrete in what you're offering, whether it's um, programmatic experience or research advice or uh, capturing the, the voices of farmers that you're working with. If you make it concrete and urgent and personal, um, it will resonate from a communications perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Peter? Yeah, uh, well, I would say thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk and uh, also, thanks for the very good questions. I think agriculture also is a topic that hopefully can help to build bridges because I think what we've seen from the discussions at the uh, two workshops this at the uh, SAFSTA last time here this summer was that um, this is a, agriculture affects both developed and developing countries, and actually it affects both adaptation and mitigation. It's it's really a topic that um, should be able to to bring countries together, and uh, because this is, yeah, it's basically in the interest of of, uh, of all countries to be able to adapt to climate change, but also since we cannot uh, always distinguish between adaptation and mitigation, I would say for the actions, it just makes sense to um, as a as a place where we can all meet and discuss and hopefully make some progress. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, James. I, any last yeah. wise words from you? Yeah, just quickly, Annette, to say that uh, really, and, and speak to mainly the negotiating constituency, that this is the opportunity for them to seize the moment, uh, to take advantage of elevating agriculture to the position where it will significantly contribute to our sustainable development goals, uh, providing opportunities for development, uh, for job creation, for income, and well-being, nutrition, and nutritional well-being. So I think really looking at the challenge of uh, the population growth globally and looking at how we need to adapt to climate change and climate variability is really to urge negotiators to come together with all of the efforts at the national level in terms of planning, uh, integrating the national appropriate mitigation actions with the national adaptation plans, uh, bring those together and synergize with all the efforts of the key players at the national level to really argue for a collective e effort globally that will result in an agriculture that will ensure global sustainability, uh, the provision of food security, and other sustainable development goals. Thank you. And with this, I would like to thank our three panelists for giving us uh, some great presentations and tools to engage in the negotiations. And I hope that uh, all of you who have been listening have also learned a lot from, from this webinar today. Uh, we want to thank you for attending uh, and hope that this has been very useful and we would also like to thank you for your questions. So with this, I, would, I will end the webinar and wish you all uh, a good day and hope to see you in Paris for some good negotiations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you and bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much.